Thanks, Brian. Good morning. You know, uh, before I started Dare to Share Ministries, I was a church planner and pastor of a church. I was 23 years old. I was a roofer. My best friend was a tire store manager, and we decided we we're going to plant a church. It's like dumb and dumber, plant a church. And the only thing we knew was the gospel of Christ. Neither of us had gone to seminary. I barely graduated from Bible college. He had not even gone to Bible college. He just graduated from high school. Matter of fact, when I walked into his church office, he had his high school diploma hanging on the wall. I'm like, what are you doing that with that up there? He goes, I'm trying to establish credibility. I go, then pop that sucker down because you and I were going to have to establish our credibility in a whole different way. And we started just preaching the word and preaching the gospel and worshiping Jesus. And we saw God do some amazing things. And so I always had a penchant toward teenagers because teenagers come to Christ quicker than adults. So I started a little ministry on the side called Dare to Share. And we were doing weekend conferences and I was pastoring the church and the church was growing and Dare to Share was growing and I was planning on doing both for the rest of my life. And then April 20th, 1999, the Columbine massacre happened at Columbine High School when Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold walked in to Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado and massacred uh, 13 lives and then turned the guns on themselves. And I knew a lot of the kids at Columbine High School. Um, and it shocked me and it rocked me like it did the rest of the nation. And my question was, where were the Christian kids to reach out to Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, the two shooters with the gospel of Christ? So I ended up resigning from Grace Church to pursue Dare to Share full time. And what our goal is and our vision is, is to engage every teenager in America in a gospel conversation. And we want to do that through raising up 30,000 gospel-advancing ministries. What we mean are churches or youth groups or parachurch organizations that say, you know what, we're going to reach not just the teenagers, but we're going to reach the adults in our community. And we're going to engage our people to initiate those gospel conversations. See, too many times in churches we expect the pastor to do all the heavy lifting. But the, the key is the pastor is there to get all of us to engage in our worlds with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so would you please pray for us as we travel the nation and we do conferences and we have apps and curriculum and full week leadership trainings to raise up 30,000 gospel advancing ministries who will engage every teenager in this nation in gospel conversations. The only way that's going to happen is if God's people pray. I want to see revival. I'm tired of reading about revivals of the past. I want to see one before I die. And it's going to take God's people praying. So please join us in prayer for that. As a matter of fact, let us pray right now. Father, I pray that you would do a mighty work in the hearts of every person in this auditorium. And that, Father, you would help them to see themselves as missionaries that you've planted at a job, in a neighborhood, at a school, in a family. And may they share the good news. May they lovingly declare the name and fame of Jesus. Do that mighty work today in Jesus' name. Amen. I love Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I've seen this in my own family growing up. I don't come from a typical church-going, pew-sitting, hymn-singing, Bible-reading family. I come from a family filled with bodybuilding, tobacco-chewing, beer-drinking thugs. And that's just the women. I mean, it was, a, it was a rough family. I was raised in the highest crime rate area of Denver. And sadly, my family had something to do with that crime rate. The uh, Small Dones, which is the Denver version of the Mafia, knew my uncles as the crazy brothers. So when the Mafia thinks your family's dysfunctional, you got some serious challenges. That was my family growing up. Three of my uncles were title-winning bodybuilders. The fourth one could bench press 500 pounds. The fifth one was a Golden Gloves boxer. My mom was the only girl in the group, and they were all afraid of her. It was a tough, tough family. But then a preacher who spoke with a southern accent and for some reason whose nickname was Yankee, on a dare, reached out to my Uncle Jack. Now, my Uncle Jack was a bodybuilder, tattoos everywhere, big lamb chop sideburns. He talked like this. In and out of jail his whole life. Once for choking two cops unconscious who were trying to arrest him at the same time. 
Jack was bad to the bone, and he knew a guy named Bob Daly, and Bob Daly was a Christian, but Bob Daly was too afraid to share the gospel with my Uncle Jack. So Bob Daly dared Yankee, this fearless preacher from the suburbs, to reach my Uncle Jack with the gospel. Well, Yankee was fearless. He went to the door, knocked on Jack's door. Jack comes to the door, no shirt on, tattoos everywhere. The biggest German shepherd you'd ever seen. I think he actually shot it up with steroids. It was huge. Listen to me now, I'm a German shepherd. You know, huge dog, right? Jack's at the door, two beer cans, one for drinking beer, one for spit and chew. He goes, what do you want? He goes, my name's Yankee Arnold, and I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. He goes, well, I don't know Jesus, but I know Bob, so come on in. I'll give you five minutes. In that five minutes, Yankee shared, not religion, but the good news of the gospel of grace with my Uncle Jack. See, my Uncle Jack already knew he was a sinner. He already knew he was going to hell. He figured I might as well just have fun because I'm not going to just try to put on white frosting over the burnt cake that I am. But for the first time, he heard that Jesus loved him enough that he died for him, that salvation was not a matter of doing anything. It was a matter of receiving this free gift through faith in Jesus Christ. And at that moment, Yankee looked across the table and says, does that make sense? And my Uncle Jack didn't know any better. He said, hell yeah. That was a sinner's prayer, was hell yeah. He put his faith in Christ, and, and they immediately wanted to tell other people about Jesus. The next day, he went to the meatpacking place where he worked, and he told Thumper, another bodybuilder, about Christ. Thumper says, you've got to tell my whole family. Every night for the next two weeks, my Uncle Jack went over to this family's house and led every single one of them to Christ. You ever meet a new believer that doesn't know the rules yet? That was my Uncle Jack, right? Because he would force you in. If you didn't take Jesus, he'd give you Moses right upside your head, right? One day, he's in a sauna. He's sharing the gospel with another bodybuilder, and another guy from a different religion keeps interrupting. He doesn't know the rules about loving your enemies yet. He goes, hey, I'm trying to tell this guy about Jesus. Why don't you shut your stinking mouth, all right? Shut it up, all right? He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts again. He goes, yo, one more time, I'm taking you out. He continues to share the gospel. The guy made the mistake of interrupting again. Boom, Jack just nails this guy. The guy falls to the ground, looks up, and goes, Jesus didn't go around hitting people like that. He goes, well, I ain't Jesus. I'm Jack, right? Didn't know the rules yet. One day on a Sunday morning, he's getting the itch, what he calls the itch. I got to tell somebody about Jesus. Driving down the street on a Sunday morning, he goes, where's some people I could tell about Jesus on a Sunday morning? Drives past a Mormon church. He goes, oh, they're in there. Pulls in. Goes in, says, hey, where's the newcomer Sunday school class? Down the hallway to the right. He goes down the hallway to the right. He goes, I got a testimony. They all think he's a new Mormon. He stands up. He gives a testimony, all right. He gives the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gives an invitation in the Mormon church. 18 of the 25 new Mormons became new Christians that day. Because Jack was reached by a preacher that was willing to do whatever it took to reach my Uncle Jack with the gospel. Whatever it takes. One by one by one by one, my Uncle Bob trusted Christ in the back of the squad car. I had the privilege of leading my own mom to Jesus Christ. I never knew my biological father. I was a one-night stand. Mom thought God would never forgive her because she drove from Denver to Boston to have an illegal abortion. She was going to abort me. My grandparents got a hold of her said, you come back and have that kid. We'll help you raise him. She did, but every time she looked at me, she began to weep because she almost killed me in her womb. But Yankee trained me to share my faith, and I started sharing my faith with my mom. And finally, when I was 15 years old, she put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes, it all started with a preacher that was willing to do whatever it took. My question is, are you willing to do whatever it takes to reach the people in your world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's why I love the passage we're going to read this morning. In Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, if you open your Bible to so Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, 1 through 11, we're going to read the story of four guys that were willing to do whatever it took to bring their friend to Jesus. Mark 2, 1 through 11. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered, there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I love this story because it's a story of four very determined men who were going to do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. They go. This house is packed out. There's no way in. So they climb on top of the roof and they dig a hole through the roof and lower their friend in. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get your friend to Jesus? Let me just tell you a couple things. Number one, it's worth the trouble. Because Jesus, in this passage, he heals not only the body of the paralytic, he heals the soul. Son, your sins are forgiven. And we live among a people who desperately need the hope that only Jesus Christ can offer. He can heal their souls. But too many times, the way that we share the gospel turns people off. What are we known as? We are known as the anti-people. I remember I was preaching a years ago, 10 years ago, at Promise Keepers, a Promise Keepers event, event uh, in Baltimore, uh, and Maryland, and there was 10,000 guys at this event, and I was getting all excited to go preach to them, and I remember getting into the van to go over to the venue to preach, and I get in the speaker van that took over the speakers, and this, the driver goes, sorry, son, this is for speakers, and I had my speaker lanyard. I go, well, I'm a speaker. He goes, oh, I've never heard of you. I go, nobody has, but can you give me a ride? He goes, sure, so he gives me a ride, so I go into the venue. I try to get backstage. Sorry, speakers only. I'm like, I'm a speaker. Oh, come on back. So I had to keep that lanyard with me all day. Well, I ended up preaching at a Promise Keepers event. And I don't know how many of you guys in here have ever been to a PK event, but it's hard to miss because guys are all pumped up. It doesn't matter what you say, right? You could just say, I love Jesus. How about you for 30 minutes? And they'd be like, yeah, man, that guy is deep. Woo, you know, because they, they're all pumped up, right? So I get finished preaching. I get back in the speaker van. We're driving away. And right in the middle of Baltimore and right across the street from the venue, there was a big group of lesbians protesting the Promise Keepers event. I knew they were lesbians because they had a big sign that said, we're lesbians, right? <laughs> and we're driving past them. I'm like, lesbians, pull over. And the driver's like, lesbians? And he pulls over. <laughs> and I get out of the car and I run across the street. I go, what are you guys protesting? We're protesting Promise Keepers because they hate gays. I go, well, you know, I'm a Promise Keeper speaker and I don't hate gays. And I showed them my badge. And they're like, well, you think it's a sin? I go, I do. But you don't. They said, it's not a sin. I go, you know what? We could argue about that all day. I said, let me ask you a different question. Are you a sinner? They're like, homosexuality is not a sin. I go, no, no, we're going to set that aside. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah. Have you ever cheated? Yeah. I go, we got something in common. We both lust after women. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> And they start laughing. And the walls started coming down. And I'm going to tell you, right there in the inner city streets of Baltimore, I had a real conversation with a group of lesbian women who for the first time maybe really heard the gospel. None of them put their faith in Christ on the spot, but we had a real conversation about Jesus. See, we need to communicate the gospel of Jesus as it is, good news. And we need to do it with humility because guess what? We need the gospel more than anybody. We're not better than anybody. That's why I love the definition of evangelism as one beggar showing another beggar where to find the bread. We share that good news because Jesus can heal their souls. It's worth the trouble. It's also worth the risk. I want you to stop and think about the risk these four guys were taking in tearing a hole through the roof. I want you to think about this. I Just put yourself in that position for a moment. These guys climb the roof, and they have to have some kind of tools to be able to dig through the roof. I did a little research on ancient roofs. Ancient roofs usually were one feet to two feet thick. On top, there was two to four inches of clay for waterproofing. And then underneath, there was a lot of branches and different things, even woven mats. And then obviously these large cross beams. 
And literally, they're digging through this roof. Matter of fact, I kind of estimated that if you, if you were going to do this, you would need some sort, of, some sort of axe, right? Or some sort of equipment. And I estimated that four full-grown guys with the right equipment would take probably 20 to 40 minutes to dig through a hole big enough to be able to bring a full-grown man, to send a full-grown man through, through that hole to the ground. Now, I think I'm, I'm qualified to do that because for eight years of my life, I was a roofer. That's what I did for a living. And I just imagine this passage in a different way. I imagine this crowded house, and all of a sudden, you hear this. You know, you're sitting there listening to Jesus talk, and then you hear this, and you just keep hearing it, and stuff starts falling through, and it goes on for 20 to 40 minutes, right? And finally, they drop this guy through. I want you to imagine this for a moment, because what, this, what was happening in this passage, again, I look at through the lenses of a roofer, this was a very dangerous thing. They were literally risking their lives. Because those of you who do, know, do construction know when you're tearing up a roof, one of the bad things that can happen is you're, you're tearing up the support from underneath it. You can literally fall through the roof and die. Not only were they risking their safety, they were risking their money. I mean, we don't think about this, but I do as a former roofer. Somebody had to pay for that roof. I'm sure these guys gathered beforehand and said, okay, we'll, we'll cover the cost of getting it fixed, but we're going to tear a hole through that roof. They risked their lives. They risked their money. They risked embarrassment. I don't know about you, but I get embarrassed if a church is full and the only open seats are in the front and I have to walk in late to a church service and sit in the front, let alone bungee jumping through the roof, right? And they were risking their place in the synagogue. Matter of fact, I'm sure that these four guys knew that the religious leaders who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah were in there and that their act of faith would get them kicked out of the synagogue. So they were risking their place in the synagogue. But they were willing to risk whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. Their money, their bodies, their relationships... They were going to do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus because they knew Jesus could heal his body and heal his soul. Are we willing to risk whatever it takes to get our friend to Jesus? And sometimes doing this, I just want to tell you, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of time. You know, I tell these radical stories of my uncles coming to Jesus, but there's one story that's harder to tell, and that's the story of my Uncle Richard. My Uncle Richard, all my uncles had these radical conversions. Uncle Richard didn't live in Denver. He lived in Arizona. And he didn't buy off on this whole Jesus thing. And when my uncles all came to Christ, he thought they were nuts. And they would try to share Jesus with him. And he's like, guys, just shut it down. You're not going to convert me. My grandfather died when I was 15 years old. And Uncle Richard came back into town. My other uncles asked me to give the gospel at the funeral. There were like 500 people there. And, man, I gave the gospel. I was terrified. I was 15. But I was looking at all the, all, of all the people that I gave a chance to respond to Christ. I was looking at my Uncle Richard. I had everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And I said, if that message made sense and you're trusting in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And a bunch of hands went up all over the place. My Uncle Richard, he didn't even have his eyes closed or his head bowed. He had his arms crossed. He was just looking at me like, you're not going to get me, nephew. Don't even try. That next week, I wrote him a letter that laid out the gospel. Sent it to Arizona. Called him up the week after. said, Uncle Richard, did you get my letter? He goes, yeah. How's your mom? Just change the subject. So you know what we did? My uncles, my cousins, myself, we said, you know what? We're going to break through those barriers. We're going to do whatever it took. So you know what we did? We kept those conversations going. And we kept praying. And every time we thought about it, we just brought, God, brought Uncle Richard up before the throne room of God. Every conversation we had, we tried to segue to the gospel, trying to break through those barriers. One year passed, then two, then ten, finally twelve years pass. And Uncle Richard's coming back into town one last time for another funeral, this time his own. See, Uncle Richard had stage four cancer. And Uncle Richard, once a bodybuilder himself, was now facing death. He came back to say goodbye, and all my uncles desperately were trying to reach him with the gospel, and he still shut him down. By this time, I was a pastor, and in a desperate attempt to get him saved, they begged him, hey, Richard, let's go hear our little nephew preach. 
just as a family, one last time. He reluctantly agreed, and I'll never forget the day my family walked in. They took up the two last rows. So here's all these bodybuilders there, right? These two last rows, and there's my Uncle Richard at the end. Once a bodybuilder again now, he's just shriveled up, but he's listening there. I give the sermon. I give the gospel at the end. I everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. This time he bowed his head and closed his eyes. I said, if that message made sense, and if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. Boom, his hand went up. Boom, all my uncles started crying because they were peeking through their fingers down the row to see if Uncle Richard would put his faith in Jesus. And he did. And I'll never forget Uncle Richard coming up to me afterward and saying, listen, I want you to give the gospel at my funeral. And in the three months he lived after that, he shared Christ with more people in those three months than most Christians will share their entire lives. Uncle Richard went to heaven. Whatever it takes. It took 12 years of awkward conversations, 12 years of prayer, 12 years of planning, of persistence, and it was worth it for one. I want you to start to think of the person that the Holy Spirit right now is impressing on your heart who doesn't know Jesus. Coworker? Family member? Neighbor, classmate, friend. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get that person to Jesus? I know you have a top five, but I want you to think of that one that you're going to start with. Why should we do whatever it takes to get that friend to Jesus? Because Jesus was willing to do whatever it takes to reach us. See, Jesus risked his riches and reputation. Philippians 2, 5 through 7, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness 2,000 years ago in a very real way. Jesus got up out of his throne and in a sense picked up an axe and he, he literally tore a hole through the floor of heaven so that he could descend and become one of us. Jesus became the God-man. He lived the perfect life we could never live. He gave up all the glory of heaven and exchanged it for the pain of humanity. Jesus risked his riches and reputations. Jesus risked his body. Mark 15, 24 starts with four simple words, and they crucified him. They took Jesus, and he was willing to do whatever it took. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him bloody. They put him over a stump. They took a cat of nine tails, a rod with nine strands of leather, leather and broken pieces of pottery and glass and razor. They flung it into his back, his buttock and his legs again and again and again and again until his back, his buttock and legs were nothing but bloody ribbons of flesh and muscle and sinew. And they nicknamed, the Romans nicknamed this beating the half death because half the dudes that went on the stump died on the stump but not Jesus. He had a task to complete. So beaten he didn't even look human. They marched him up to the top of Calvary and they nailed him to the cross and he hung there for six hours, struggling for every breath, pushing up against this rough hewn wood of the cross. Whatever it takes. And at the sixth hour, he screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that one moment, God the Father took all of his anger and all of his wrath and all of his hatred for all of our sin, all of everyone's sin, who's ever lived, whoever will live. And he poured it out in full measure on the body, the spirit, and the soul of Jesus. And for the first time in a way I cannot comprehend, there was a tremor in the Trinity, and the Father turned his back on his Son. And Jesus screamed out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He risked his closest relationship. The only recorded time that he screamed was that separation from the Father, not from the physical pain, but from the emotional and spiritual pain to bear the sin of humanity and have his Father turn his back on him. And then he said the three words that would change the course of humanity. It is finished. I did what it took. He bowed his head and he died. Whatever it takes to reach us. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. It's not a game. It's not a meeting. This is a mission. And you are a missionary. God has placed you in a job, in a neighborhood, in a family, at a school to be a missionary. And I want you to start with that one. And I want to ask you to start with that one person in the next 48 hours. To start a gospel conversation. To bring it up. In the next 48 hours. Maybe that means you write a letter to them. Maybe that means you text them right after the church service and say, we need to get together. Maybe it starts by you inviting them out to church with you and then lunch afterwards so you can talk about it. However you choose to do it, I'm going to ask you to do it within the next 48 hours. And while you're thinking and praying about that challenge, I want to tell you the story of one young man whose name was Doug. Now, Doug... He struggled. He was from the inner city. He came from a broken family. Doug was slow. And kids in the, his public school would make fun of him and beat him up. Doug had epilepsy, so anytime he could have a grand mal seizure, he did not have a lot of friends. And his life began to spiral out of control because Doug fought back. Soon he was getting expelled out of school. Soon he was getting in trouble with the law. His life was in a downward spiral. But then, one day, a preacher reached into his life, brought him out to camp, and Doug was trained and equipped for that mission. And for the first time in his life, Doug knew he had a purpose, and that purpose was to tell everybody about Jesus. And again, a new believer that didn't know the rules, Doug just began to tell everybody as a high school student about Jesus. He didn't own a car, didn't even own a bike at the time. And he would literally walk across the city streets of Denver. It was nothing to be driving down the street and seeing Doug walking around, talking to people that were hitchhiking or people at the bus stop or, or people at the local store. Doug would tell everybody about Jesus because he was so excited about this mission that God gave him, that he had a purpose in life. One day, Doug, on, early on a Saturday morning, said, hey, Greg, let's go out and tell people about Jesus. I'm like, it's kind of early. He's like, well, people need Jesus. We don't want people to go to hell. I mean, how are you going to say no to that? I'm like, okay. So we go out and we're looking for people. There's nobody to talk to about Jesus. And Doug's getting frustrated. He's like, where is everyone? I said, they're still sleeping, right? So we go to a park and we see about 100 yards away, there looked to be about an 8-year-old boy playing on a jungle gym. And Doug got excited. He goes, there's one! And starts running at this kid, screaming, hey, kid, where are you going to go when you die? And the kid was terrified. He goes, home, and ran as fast as he could, right? Doug came back all discouraged. I go, Doug, you scared that kid to death. I'll never forget his response. I didn't mean to scare that kid to death. I just want that kid to know about Jesus. Doug saved up his money, bought a, a bicycle, rode that bike all over the city streets of Denver, telling people about Jesus. Again, it was nothing to be driving down the street and seeing Doug on his bike, pulled over, telling somebody about Christ. One day he pulled up to a stoplight, and there's a car full of guys he thinks to himself, they need Jesus. The light's red. He knocks on the window. They roll down the window. He begins to share Christ with them. They think he's crazy, but they listen. But the light turns green halfway through. They said, we got to go, dude. He goes, I'm not done. So you go ahead and drive. He holds onto the handle, and they take off. 10, 20, 30, 45 miles an hour. Doug's balancing himself, sharing the gospel with these guys. As he gets finished, he goes, I hope you believe. And he peels off to safety. Later on, he tells me the story. I go, Doug, you're an idiot. You could have got sucked under those tires, run over, and killed. He goes, it'd be worth it. I just want those guys to know Jesus. Finally graduated from high school. Went to a Perkins, was having coffee. He saw one of the waitresses. He thought she was cute, but he had a rule that he would not date an unbeliever. So he led her to Christ right there and asked her out right after. <laughs> she said yes. They went out. He thought, man, this is the one. Asked her, like on their first or second date, would you marry me? She thought he was joking. Sure. He wasn't joking. Six months later, they got married. 
And now Doug lives in Des Moines, Iowa. And for the last 30 years, Doug has been a custodian, mostly at a public school. And over those 30 years, Doug has been able to talk to countless students and teachers and administrators about Jesus. And Doug is absolutely unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Matter of fact, Doug just had to retire because he's starting to lose his memory. He's starting to forget a lot of things. We talk about once a week. The one thing he has not forgotten is the message of Jesus. And he's still telling people about Jesus. And at the judgment seat of Christ, when Doug's name is called, there's going to be thousands who stand and applaud, who are led to Christ by this custodian, by this epileptic, by this guy who struggled socially on every level. But he was willing to do whatever it took and whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. And I want to be one, one of the ones standing and applauding because Doug is my big brother. He's seven years older than me. And I tell you, one of the reasons I'm doing Dare to Share, one of the reasons I'm traveling the nation, training and equipping young people to share their faith, is I knew if my big brother Doug Steer can share his faith with all of his disabilities and all of his struggles, that I can, that they can, that you can. I'm not asking you to get a bike and drive down the street and talk to people at intersections. I'm not asking you to go to parks and scare kids with the gospel. Please don't. I'm asking you to start in your circle with one. Will you take the 48-hour challenge? Why 48 hours? Because studies show that if you don't do what you've learned... Within 48 hours, you'll never do it. Why 48 hours? Because I'm sick and stinking tired of Christians talking about evangelism and not doing it. I love the words of Charles Spurgeon to his preacher boys. He said, gentlemen, do something, do something, do something. When everybody else is talking about doing something, do something. When everyone else is working on the church constitution, do something. Our goal, gentlemen, is not to talk about saving souls, but to do it, and that for the glory of God. Will you do something in the next 48 hours. Can I have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to give you the 48-hour challenge. Will you bring it up in some way? Will you initiate that gospel conversation in some way in the next 48 hours? If you're willing to say yes, by God's grace, with that one person God has placed on my heart, I will bring it up. I will embrace that awkward conversation. I'll write that letter. I'll, uh, I'll bring it up. And if you're willing to do that in the next 48 hours before God, not before me, with heads bowed and eyes closed, can you simply raise up your hand? Wow. 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 You can put your hands down. Praise God. Look up here, everybody. There's an army of you, young and old, that are saying, yes, I'm going to initiate that gospel conversation. I want you to know I'm going to be praying for you. Brian's going to be praying for you. And listen, here's the deal. We've got to be praying for each other. I want you to come back next week with a story or two to, to tell Brian. Good, bad, and ugly. Because listen, we're just there to share the gospel, right? We're in marketing, not sales. God's the one that closes the deal in their heart, right? We share the good news, and the Holy Spirit does the good work. But come back with stories to share. And let's fill those. Look at these empty chairs here. Let's fill these chairs up with the people that we've led to Jesus or that are on their way to being led to Jesus and let's get them into these spiritual conversations it starts with that one conversation right with one of the five people on your top five list I really want to challenge you to do that listen I'm going to also give you a couple challenges uh, one is would you join our prayer team at dare to share I mean we want to see this happen in churches across the nation and youth groups across the nation uh, and right at the end right by the information table there is our table uh, you can sign up just with your email, and every two weeks we'll send you a short email that will give you a prayer request so we can reach the, this next generation. Please join us in prayer. Just join us at the table right there afterward. Also want to encourage you with this. Um, a Dare to Share app. Some of you are like, I, I want to share my faith. I don't exactly know how to do it. Uh, we have a free app. If you have a smartphone or an iPad or whatever, uh, it's Dare to Share. It's a number two. Just Dare to Share it's free on, in the iTunes store or Google Play. You just download it to your phone. It's video-based. Literally, you can watch the videos, and it will train you 
how to show your faith from what we call takeoff to touchdown. How do you bring it up? How do you explain it? It's not a technique. It's really help, helping you articulate the message of the gospel. Um, again, dare the number two share free on your smartphone. And also, um, we have a book. It's called Dare to Share. It's a field guide to sharing your faith with anyone, anywhere, anytime. These are available at the table uh, by the information center as well. Uh, this is literally, we have a chapter called How to Bring It Up Without Throwing Up, right? How to discover your style of evangelism. There's different styles. We call them, ta there's talkers, stalkers, buddies, and brains, right? Talkers are the ones that can bring it up anytime, anywhere, like the Apostle Paul. Stalkers are the ones that just can abruptly, kind of boldly share it, like Peter. Literally in Acts 2, you know what is the greatest opening line for any sermon ever? We're not drunk. That's how he opened up his sermon in Acts 2, which is great. Um, buddies like Barnabas, Aquila and Priscilla, and then brains like Luke, the Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell of his time. You can find out your style of evangelism. How, how do you explain the gospel? There's not a method, but how do you explain the message of the gospel, right? And then in the back, there's a section on how to reach 13 different worldviews. How do you reach Mormons, Muslims, Buddhists? Uh, atheists, agnostics, Satanists, and instead of how to beat them over the head, it's how to engage them, not enrage them. You know, how to love them into the kingdom. Listen, it's not a matter of, of arguing people in. It's a matter of winning people over with the good news of Jesus Christ. So all this is available. These are like $10, and every dime goes back into Dare to Share and helps us reach a generation with the gospel. So I encourage you to read it and then give this to a teenager you know or a young person you know and encourage them uh, to read it as well. I'm going to be by that table after the service. I would love to meet you and talk to you. But I want, to, I want to say one last thing. Some of you came in this room today not ready to take the 48-hour challenge because you don't know exactly where your soul is. You don't know for sure your sins are forgiven. You don't know for sure you're a child of God. You don't know for sure... Why are you here on this earth? You don't know for sure that if you were to die right now that you'd be in the presence of God. You hope, but you don't know. You can know. It's the gospel. That word means good news. God created us to be in a relationship with him. See, God made you to be in a eternal relationship with him. But the problem is our sins separate us from God. God is a holy God. He hates sin, but he loves us. And those sins separate us from God. And those sins, they could never be removed by good deeds. A lot of people think, well, if I'm good enough, the problem is we have to be as good as God to get into heaven. We have to be good as God to be his children. And we're not. We all fall short. We all miss the mark. So paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died in our place for our sin. And now everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. It's not a matter of trying, it's a matter of trusting. If you believe that he died for you and you trust in him alone, you have everlasting life and life with Jesus starts now and it lasts forever. You enter into a personal, permanent relationship with the God of the universe that can never be separated by you and will never be separated by him. And it's simply a matter of faith. So if you came in this room and you don't know for sure you have a relationship with God, if you don't know for sure you're going to go to heaven when you die, if you don't know for sure that you're right now you are child, God's child, you can know it through faith right now, right where you sit. Will you believe? Will you receive this free gift of eternal life? One more time. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you don't know for sure, but you want to know, in the silence of your soul, you can say this prayer to God. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I fall short. But I believe you created me to be in a relationship with you. I know that my sins can never be removed by good deeds. But right now I believe that paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. And I trust in him. And 
I receive that gift of eternal life right now. With heads bowed and eyes closed, my friend, if you just put your faith in Jesus, you're saved, you're adopted, you're born again, you're transformed, you're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. Not because you said a prayer, but because you trusted in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And I'd like to know who you are so I can pray for you. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that message made sense to you and for the first time you put your faith in Jesus, you received that gift of eternal life, but no one looking around, can you simply raise up your hand and put it right back down? God bless you and you. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm trusting in Jesus. God bless you. I'm receiving that gift of eternal life. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. Put it right back down. God bless you. Just those who raised your hand. Nobody else. Just those who raised your hand. Look up at me real quick. If you trusted in Jesus, if you truly trusted in Jesus, you've been passed out of death into life. I want to be the first one to welcome you into the family of God. I want you to let somebody at this church know because they want to help you grow in your faith. But welcome, welcome, welcome to the family of God. Amen, God's people. Let's give God a hand. Amen, amen, amen. And now it's our turn. Let's go and share that good news with one other this week, next 48 hours. And let's see what God does, whatever it takes. Father, fill us, fuel us with your Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to proclaim boldly and clearly. So fill us and use us. In Jesus' name, all God's children said, amen.